All right, today we're starting chapter five, uh, sections one and two, because they go together. Section one discusses the addition and subtraction of integers. Okay, so what is an integer? Right. It's everything from negative infinity down to zero and then up to positive infinity. Remember, the first set of numbers we talked about were natural numbers, which are these. Those are the natural numbers. Then we include zero, those become the whole numbers. And we talked about addition and subtraction of whole numbers. Now we talk about integers, which are everything positive and negative. What would be the next set of numbers we discuss? If you notice, this is how education goes, especially in, in the primary education. You have to start with the basic numbers, counting numbers, that's natural numbers. Then we include the concept of nothing, a zero. Then we introduce the concept of negative numbers. So after positive and negatives and zeros, what else, what else is there? Yeah, everything between zero and one. So everything between there are called rational numbers. Those include decimals, fractions, because rational numbers means fractions it's a ratio. Again, the first day of class, I told you all, it's important to know the definition. To be honest with you, it's more important to know the definition than to know the procedures. Because procedures, is, you're going to learn just by doing it over and over and over. But you don't know what to do unless you know what you're asking me asked to do. Now, in this section, in section one, we're going to talk about different ways of how to teach addition and subtraction of positives and negatives. So let's look at the first example. Example 11. It says compute each of the following with and without a calculator. Why would it ask you to do with and without a calculator? But why would it? But why would it tell you to use both? How do you know what you entered is correct? Did I have to tell you a story why I never use calculators? When I was an undergraduate, I was it was an engineering class. It was a computer programming course, and the instructor put a bunch of small numbers like two, three, negative one, four, zero, negative one, negative two, negative four, four. I mean, that's nothing big. And this one kid bought a calculator. He thought he was, was back then. That's when they cost over a hundred dollars for a basic calculator. And he entered the numbers in there, and he spit out the answer, something like twelve hundred million to the power of five. He did it again. He got a different number. He spent the entire day, the entire class period that day, arguing with the instructor. We wasted an entire day. It turned out the batteries are going dead. But he thought that what was on that screen was gospel. Because of that, I never used calculators. Because what if you enter a number in wrong? I mean, it's, it's very easy to enter a number incorrectly. Forget a decimal someplace. And yet, you're going to swear up and down that's the right answer. You'll put it down without even thinking about it. That's why if you're going to use a calculator, use it to 
complement and not supplement your learning. That's a big, that's a big difference. Complement means check your answers. Don't let it do the work for you. You do the work and you let it check your work. And if you come out different answers, try it again. On a blank piece of paper, get work it out again, and then type it back again. See if you get the same thing. So again, but state law says that in primary and secondary education, you're supposed to teach them how to use calculators. Does anybody know why? Well, that's 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 where the calculators, but why is there a law now in the TEA, Texas Education Agency, that says we have to teach in primary secondary education, we have to teach them how to use calculators. But yeah, that, that was a business decision by Texas Instruments. But why are why is the TEA, why are the schools so adamant about using calculators in classrooms? No. That's true, but it's not the reason. Think about how many kids would pass math if they had to do it by hand. Now, if they don't pass math, what do they have to do next year? They're held back. You have those students who failed the course, and then the, all the new students come in, not enough room. So to make everybody happy, they just let them use calculators, graphing and everything. I mean, the, I don't know if you know, if you've ever seen the TI, the Inspirons, the calculators, they will do everything for you. You, you, all you have to do is if you're given data, just put in the numbers, it will find the equation, the formula for you. It'll it'll draw the graph for you. It'll do everything. You have to do nothing except type it in. So all we're doing is teaching people how to be secretaries. Just type. But then ask the kids, what does that mean? I don't know. But that's the law. But you as instructors still know how to, have to know how to do this because you have to show it to them on pencil paper on the board. How to do this stuff. So, I'm not going to use a calculator. Yes, use. What do we do here first? What What do we rely on to answer these? So, if I give you this problem here, what would what rule, what process would you fall back on to answer that? Order of operations. Again, in my rooms, PEMDAS is never used because even okay, you will you will use that in your your classrooms because it's something it's easy for them to realize remember. But as I mean, I can show you my calculus class, the notes in there that we have thirty or forty symbols we use that's not, not even in PEMDAS that you can't even do. So what does PEMDAS tell us? Or forget that. What does op order of operations tell us? Well, yeah, start left, right. Look at it. Order of operation. Operations. That's what I call it, the oops. Order of operations. The first thing you do is look for any special operations. Parentheses, brackets, exponents, square roots, absolute values, uh, factorials, anything. Are there any special operations there? Reading left to right? No. The next thing we do is multiplication and division. Are there any multiplication and division there? No. So we go down to addition, subtraction. Because mathematics is a language, we read it from left to right. The same way you would a textbook or a letter. Which is funny because algebra is was invented the concept was invented in Saudi Arabia. How do they read? 
They read right to left. But yet, yeah, we use the rules of left to right, which is amazing. All right, so left to right. Two minus five is what? Why is it negative three? Well, since you have different signs, one's positive, one's negative, what number is bigger, two or five? What's the sign of five is negative. So the answer is going to be negative. So it's five minus two is three. You teach kids how to do it that way, I guarantee you it's going to minimize the sign errors that they have. Next step. No special operations, no multiplication division, so we have addition subtraction. What's the rule if they both have the same sign? What's the rule? There's something I do first. We talked about it about three or four weeks ago before spring break. Again, it's it's the rules that are important because mathematics is it's, it's a it's a rule based language. They're both negative, so the answer is going to be what? Negative. Since the signs are the same, we add the numbers. You're right. You just weren't there yet. Five plus three is eight. So there's your answer. The next one. Same thing, left to right, no special operations, no application division. So we get three minus seven. Since they have different signs, seven is bigger and it's negative, the answer is gonna be negative. Seven minus three is four. They have different signs, four is bigger than three and four is negative, the answer is gonna be negative. Four minus three, is one, so there's an answer. C brings out another interesting fact. Because along with the order of operations, we have to teach the students the properties of math, which we did the first week of class. What does the property tell us here? What does order of operations tell us here? Yeah, special operations. Here's parentheses. So we got to do inside the parentheses first. Seven minus three is positive. Since seven is positive, it's positive four. Can we do anything inside the parentheses? No, there's no operation. So we could drop the parentheses. They have different signs. Four is bigger, so the answer is negative. Four minus three is one. And this would be a perfect example of where you'd show the students, there's as long as you use the rules of math, there's more than one way of doing it. Let's look at C again. Let's look at this one again. Do we have any other rules that we can do, we can apply here? Very good. We can use the properties now. The properties say if you have parentheses, remember, the distributive property says this. Whatever coefficient I have in front of parentheses, I could multiply it to everybody inside there and get that gets rid of the parentheses. So I could do the same thing here. That negative sign, it's actually a what? What number is there? A negative one, right? So this three stays alone. So negative times positive is negative. One times seven is seven. Negative times negative is positive. One times three is three. Now we read left to right. So since there are no more parentheses, we combine like terms or simple solve it. Three minus seven. 
negative 4. Because 7 is bigger than it's negative. 4 is bigger than 3, it's negative. 4 minus 3 is 1. If you notice, B and C are the same thing. So what do y'all think? So far so good? You see how important it is to have the rules, the order of operations, the rules, you have to have that at your disposition. Huh. Why are all these backwards? Because for some reason, it printed backwards. I don't know why. All right, anyway. So addition, what is addition? Well, that would be multiplication. That would be subtraction. So the combine, combination means you're combining. So it could be any process. But what do you do when you add? Mm -hmm. You're increasing the value of two numbers. So you're, you're combining two numbers to increase its value. So, yeah. And a subtraction is what? So that's why if we have three plus two, that equals five. Three minus two is equal to one. Or three minus one equals two. We can look at some properties here by observation. In addition, the sum, this is called a sum, because you're adding two numbers. The sum is always larger than either or any of the numbers that are combined. Actually, the opposite, because we both have negative and negative. But the value 5 is bigger than 3 and 2, even at, at the other individually. But subtraction, can we say the same thing? What is this answer here called in, in subtraction? If that's called the sum in addition, what is this number called? Very good. It's called the difference. So if you're asked to find the difference between two numbers, they're asking you to subtract them. Now notice the difference, the number here, is it bigger than the other numbers? Is it smaller than all the numbers? Well, that's not true, but that's why I put the second one here. So the difference, the property here that we have to go through, the difference has to be less than or equal to the largest number. 3 minus 0 is 3. So this difference has to be, here's the biggest number, this number has to be equal to or less than that one. This number has to be equal to or less than the biggest number. So these are what properties are derived by observing patterns that form. So how do we introduce the concept of subtraction? Because we're going to go through all these in a second. But I was, well, how do we go through the concept of subtraction? What are we actually doing there? What we're actually doing here is we're adding 
a negative number. Believe it or not, calculators and computers do it this way. There is no operation of subtraction. There is only addition and multiplication. So what computers do is they break this down to this way. So we have a positive three and we add a negative two. How would you teach that concept to kids? Okay, well, very good. Yeah, Lem number line is actually, that one follows you in college also. When you learn algebra, the first chapter, you learn number line. And then you learn the Cartesian coordinate system, the XY graph, which is just two number lines. So how would you teach addition with number lines? Yeah, so the number lines, you have to first define what integers are, what whole numbers are, what natural numbers are. And then we show the students how they're situated. The kids, if they're paying attention, if they're curious, they're going to ask you, why do we go that way? Because think of how kids see these. When I was in elementary school, I drew a picture of a ghost. And I had a little voice bubble here. Teacher said I was wrong. My, I mean, this was, I was in fourth, fifth grade. And I said, but when you say the word, what's the first letter that comes out of your mouth? B. So it's going this way out of your mouth. So it's boo. I didn't say oob. So you see, the way the kids think is they look at how things perceive to them. When you say a word, the letters come out in that order. They come out in that order. But here it's in this, it's backwards. Or if you ask a kid, if you give them these words and ask them to alphabetize them, what would you want them to do? You're right. That's how we want to, but how do kids think? You said alphabetize these three words. I alphabetized cat. What letter goes first in cat? A, C, T, in alphabetical order. In dog, D, G, O. So you have to think about how kids think things when you tell them. And that's why you have to break it down in their language. And that's the hard part. If I give you an equation, you can do it. But remember, these kids have nothing. They're, they're, they, they learn what you tell them. They know what you will tell them. Nothing more. So is this wrong? No. It's alphabetizing, putting it in alphabetical order, but it's not what you wanted. So is it is the student wrong in the way they answered it, or are, are you wrong in the way you asked it? You didn't ask it correctly. Because you said alphabetize these three words. That it says, so you have to go define what does alphabetize mean? As you said, take the first letters and put those words, depending on the first letter, in order. So, and we do the same thing with math numbers.
Why did they go to the right? That's just the way it was invented. So when if you started a number, and eventually they, they said, okay, typically if you had an X, Y graph, this is time. Does time ever stop? No. So if you have time, it always keeps on going. And Y to the right, because that's the way we read it. So if we were Arabic, we'd have it the other way. So three plus two, what does three mean? But why? Okay, so I go one, two, three. Here's three. Why zero? Yeah, zero is nothing. Zero is where you begin. So that's what we call the beginning. What is three? Three is the distance from zero. One, two, three. That's three. Because remember, originally, you're just going to give them this. So they pick a point, call it zero. And from there, you go to the right three. Why to the right? Because it's positive. Positive goes to the right. We add. This is add. Add goes to the right. From here, we go two more spaces. One, two. So that is what we have. Three, still going to the right. Two equals Five. That's using number lines. That's the quick, easy way of doing it. What's another way of teaching them addition? Besides number lines. And what are those called? <laughs> okay, we'll give you the general term are called. It's a manipulative, but those are also called number cubes. Or it's actually, to be honest with you, when you're teaching a class, you can call them whatever you want to. And I still remember mine from elementary school is because they were each made with cool colors. They weren't the regular yellow, red. They were with colors that you'd only see in a crayon box. And I remember those, because it's, it's like I'm still playing with them. And I love those little, little small, little light. Uh, the one where it was, they were purplish, grayish, it was like metallic. And then you had the fives, and you had the tens, you had the twenty, hundreds, you had the blocks. And we're playing with those. So yeah, you use manipulatives. Does it have to be number cubes? You can use toys or blocks. Yeah. The only thing, that's a great way of teaching them subtraction. <laughs> I, I, Johnny, I gave you five candies. Where are they? I subtracted five. <laughs> so I got nothing now. But yeah, so you use anything. Because why is that important? Because now you could associate the concept of what does three mean. The number three, when we think about it, it actually means three of something. Three dollars, three pennies, three whatever. And you see here... Coins are great because you can get a, a whole bunch of pennies. You, actually, you have the kids, when you're walking around anywhere, see if you see any pennies, pick them up. And then we'll start collecting them. And then we'll see how many we have at the end of the semester. And have with that, we have them keep a chart of how many coins we get each day. So we have 
on this day we got one penny and we we found five pennies we have no pennies and keep on doing that at the end of the at the end of the week end of the month whatever we can see how many pennies do we have total right yeah exactly yeah so this they they like this kind of stuff is um the you could now quantify you said what does it mean when i have five what does that mean well if i stack these pennies i have five of them if not i could put it in a chart i don't need these pennies anymore i could put those in, in our little classroom piggy bank and we can say Whatever we end up with at the end of this, at the end of the semester or into the year, I'll buy what we can. If it's cookies or cakes or cupcakes, we'll buy that with that, and that that'll teach them also financing. Is that this is what you do with your money? Put it in a bank. Eventually, it grows. <laughs> yeah, what's this green thing here? Uh, bring more of those. And credit cards have numbers. <laughs> Where's Arthur? He's on he's on a trip to Tahiti right now. <laughs> so yeah, you can use anything you want to use and you just quantify it. So that's addition. Um other thing is we can use manipulatives, we can use chips. With chips, with all of these actually, you can use to teach addition and subtraction. So addition is pretty easy. What about subtraction? How do we teach subtraction? We have all these possibilities. Are they all going to give us the same answer? Why not? Yeah. <laughs> and what's this one give you? Because yeah, uh, this is what you do. Okay, now, yeah, this we know this. How would you show it to the students? Because remember, we call this the difference. Why is it called the difference? Well, because if you think about it, from two to three, how far, what is the difference between two and three? It's different by one. Which tells us that the bigger number is equal to plus the difference. So these two things are the same. So now we're using addition to prove subtraction. Yeah, and my wife and I are putting together a research article to do a presentation because teachers always teach addition first. And students have a hard time with subtraction. What kind of songs do students learn in elementary school? Give me any any song that students learn that deals with numbers. You ever hear the song Five Little Monkeys? Ever, anybody hear that? Five little monkeys jumping on bed, one fell off, broke, broke his head, and so now you only have four. Is that addition? That's subtraction. Almost all the songs students learn in elementary school are subtraction problems. So we're saying that that should be the first thing to be taught. Once you understand that concept, now we say, okay, now that 
the monkey had fell off. He's fixed. The doctor came over, fixed his head. Now he goes back to the bed. Now what happens? Now instead of having one monkey on the bed, now you have two monkeys. Because why? Because that one came back up there. So it's how we present the rest of the material to the students, not just in math class, but everything else. It all relates. So, and you can look at chips. If you have a bowl. That's a bowl. Red and black. How can that help us? How would I prove three minus two or negative five plus one. How would I teach those using these? Red are negatives, black are positives. So this one's positive because it has no sign in front of it. So I would put three black chips in there. Minus two. That's two red chips. So how many more black chips do we have than red? Because it's black. It's positive. So we have a positive one. How about this one? In this bowl, we have five red chips and one black chip. So we have four red chip or yeah we have four red chips more than we do black chips, right? And red chips are negative. So that's how you teach them there. Or again with the same concept, You put in three black chips. They're positives. Now, for every one red chip, they cancel. You, you, they come out of there. You can only pull out one of each color. It's at the same time. Whatever is left is your answer. Because subtraction means you take away from that, that stack. Since we have... A black chip and it's positive, the answer is positive one. So here we take away one red and one black chip. What are we left with? We have one, two, three, four red chips, and red chips are negative. So that, that's another way you can do it. Number nine. Number lines actually will be used later on in the, in the career because manipulatives are the best thing for kids. They, they want to see, they want to touch things. So again, number lines. We now have to introduce the negative numbers. Why do we have to introduce negative numbers? Yeah, because just by just by that concept, you have a negative two. Because they haven't so what is negative two? Because if that wasn't there, where would I start? What would I do? Because they're the same thing. Remember how we do number lines? We start off at zero. Look at the first number. If it's positive, it goes to the right. If it's negative, it goes to the left. So here we go five. One, two, three, four, five. That's what five is. Now, from here, it says go left 
two spaces, one, two. So our, num our answer is positive three. Remember the properties we talked about at the beginning of the semester? One of them the commutative property. To commute means to move. What it means of the commutative property of addition, this is of addition and multiplication. So what does the commutative property tell us? No matter how, yeah, no matter the order you put them, it's always gonna give you the same answer. So five plus two is the same thing as two plus five. One, two, three, four, five. So this one, the side here, it says start with zero, go to the right five spaces, it's positive, so we keep on going to the right, two spaces. So the answer is seven. The commutative property also says I can flip them around. From zero, I go to the right two spaces, and then I go five more spaces to the right. So it's one, two, three, four, five. And I still get seven as an answer. Again, that's addition. That's that's straightforward. That's stuff we always do. But when we throw negatives in there, what is the commutative property tell us about negative signs? Well, it tells us the sign goes with the number. This negative belongs to this five. If I move that five, that negative goes with it. Basically, what it says is, if I, if I switch these, that negative five moves over there. Because the commutative property is says, I, if I move them, I still have a plus between them. I still have a plus between them. But what is a, if you have different signs, what does that become? Hmm. If you have opposite signs, it always becomes, because you only have one sign between two numbers. If they're opposite signs, it's always going to be a minus. And that's the other thing what you have to explain to the kids there. Why is that? And that's that's a topic for a little bit later in, in course. But they're gonna if if they're paying attention, they're gonna ask you that. So why is that? Why is if the signs are the same, why is it positive? Why is it if it's opposite signs, we're gonna use negative? Because you cannot have two signs next to each other. So how would you do this equation on a number line? What does this one tell us to do first? Go five. One, two, three, four, five, which is to the left, five. And then go to the right, two, which gives us a negative three. Why is it negative three? 
because it's to the left of zero. As opposed to this one. I go one, two. Now this says go left. Five spaces. One, two, three, four, five, which gives us negative three. Or we could use the chips, the black and red chips. I could put five reds and two blacks. Oops. How? What's the difference between if I have five reds and two blacks? These cancel. So I have three reds. Reds are negative, right? Negative. Red equals a negative sign. So this is how we would introduce the whole concept. So the students are going to ask you, so why is that? Why, 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 why? It's always a why. Subtraction deals with opposite. Two plus one equals three. Two minus one equals one. So this one says I go two to the right. And I keep on going one more to the right. They're going the same direction. But what this one tells us is now I have to go the opposite direction. Instead of going to the right, I have to go to the left now. So now they're going into opposite directions. Once that concept clicks in your students, they'll, they'll begin to see subtraction and addition in a different light. They'll even be able to solve things like this. So you start at zero. What, what direction do we go in this one? Left. So we go left three spaces. And now we keep on going left two spaces. Which says now our answer is negative five. That's using number line. How about the jar? What would they have to do here? How many of what color chips? Yeah, so we have three reds, which is open, open, open. And what does this one say? So now I have a total of five red chips and reds are negative. So all these things, and again, you have to stop there. You could, you could look at, Play with toys. If we have little army soldiers as opposed to dinosaurs, these are positive, these are negative. Back in the, <laughs> if you think about how it was back in the 40s and 50s, the US soldiers <laughs> were positive and the Germans were negative. So you can make up this, any type of thing that once the students understand, they can see the concept.
And or if you want to, you can make it your own little chips out of cardboard with a positive or a negative on there. So put if it's a positive three, put three positives. Take away two neg two of them. That's negatives. What do I have left? I have a positive. All right. So what does opposite mean? What does opposite mean? Uh, yeah, yeah, if you use a number line, if I have a number three here, what's the opposite of three? Yeah, fold it over. It's whatever's on the other side. Opposite means other side. Yeah, that's a, a get kids will see that. So then, eventually, so if we have a if we have a negative seven, what's the opposite of negative seven? Yeah, because what's what's the other number on the opposite side, the other side of zero? So what we're doing, the opposite of three is negative three. The opposite of negative seven is positive seven. Ah, now, now we have to introduce the negative of a negative. How would you explain that? Because remember, you're trying to teach these kids the first time you see it. Because if you didn't distribute it, the only way you do that is by teaching them multiplication. We haven't done that yet. Think of it this way. Number line. So what does this tell us? Which direction does this tell us to go? It says, okay, well, now we're going to go to the left. But now it's negative again. What does that one tell us to do? It tells us to change direction. So instead of left, now we're going to the right. Remember, the negatives tell us which direction to go. If we go to the left and we take a left again, doesn't mean we go left, left. It means you're changing directions. Because why is it changing directions? Because all of these numbers are positive. The opposite of two is negative two. Opposite, yes. That's exactly, that's exactly what you're getting to. Yes. That's exactly what you're seeing. Yeah. So addition is going to the right. Negative is going to the opposite direction, which is to the left, or the opposite direction. So this one's going to the opposite. Well, are you going to get this way? Inside out or order of operations. Here we have seven, but now we have to go to the left. We have to change directions, but we have to change directions again. So if we change directions, normally we're going this way. We change the direction. That's our first negative. Then we have to change the direction again. That's the second negative, which goes in a positive direction. And then to, to test if the kids really know that, then you look at something like this. What direction are we going now? Well, yeah, because this one says we go where? We go to the left. This one says we change direction, so we go where? This one says we change direction again. So one negative goes to the left, two goes to the right, three, and then we keep on going there further and say, so if you have two negatives, they cancel each other out. Why is the number like that? 
direction. direction. Exactly right. And that's notice how we first started. We started like this. From zero, positive goes to the right. Negative goes to the left. It's a direction. And you can even have kids in the classroom stand in the middle of the classroom. I'm going to put up a number, and this is the numbers. I'm going to say, okay, if I say, if I put a negative two, that means take two steps to the left. So this is your left and right. You also have to teach them left and right also, by the way. And this is a perfect way to, to teach them. And you'll see that more teachers get these wrong. Because if you're my students and I said, take a step left, which direction do I have to go? Yeah. I have to go to the right because you're copying what I'm doing. As a teacher, you got to do things backwards. So if I say, if the students are looking at me and say, okay, let's take three steps to the right. You want them to go that way, right? So if you go that way, where are they going to go? They're going to follow you. So you have to go the opposite direction. So teachers will always get, that's the hardest part, is you have to think things backwards when you look at the students. If you do things in opposite. The, yeah. So yes, yeah, so, but they have to know the alphabet first. So yeah, you see how all this stuff relates? It's not just, it's, it's easy for us, but that's why it's important to teach them all this stuff. Let's look at some examples here. Oh, let's... So the examples of example one. What's the opposite of three? What's the opposite of negative five? Now, the opposite of negative five is positive five. What's the opposite of zero? Well, yeah. Zero is... Because it's in the middle. It's where you begin. You're not going anywhere, so there's no sign. So remember, so negative five means what? If I start from a number line, what does that tell us to do? Go five steps to the left. And then positive three means go three steps to the right. These are distances. Can distances be positive or negative? Here's Grand Prairie. Dallas and Fort Worth. Let's say you're exactly between the two. And it's 23 miles to Dallas. How far is it to Fort Worth? You're exactly in the middle. Ah. You, have you ever heard anybody say, well, go negative 23 miles that way? No. Distances are always positive values. There are no negatives in distance. Because do we always go left and right? What if we're going up and down? Or what if we go diagonal? Like you're here, go four blocks here, go three blocks here. In other words, that's the same thing as going five blocks here. In the country, people say, instead of going three blocks this way and four blocks, you can go five blocks as the crow flies. Because the birds fly over the buildings and they we have to go, we have, we have to drive our cars on streets, but birds don't. So, again, this is how we relate things to mathematics. So, distance has no sign. There's always positive. It's always a number. Which brings us to what we call the absolute value. What does the absolute value look like?
what symbol, what sign do we use for absolute value? Yep. Those two little vertical lines represent absolute values. And on your keypad, if you ever had to do that, it's if you look at your keypad, um, right above the enter key, right above there, there's a key that looks like this. Oh, not good. You have to hit the control key and that one to get this. You put a number in there and hit it again to get that. That's where you get your value from. And then this is the backslash. We do whenever we do the hypertext languages. So what does the absolute value tell us? Well, the absolute value tells us it's the distance of how far a number is from zero. Case in point, like the Grand Prairie to Dallas, Grand Prairie to Fort Worth. It's how far is Fort Worth from Grand Prairie? How far is Dallas from Grand Prairie? It's an absolute value. There is no, dis there is no positive or negative. What if we had that? So absolute value of five is five. What is absolute value of negative three? Because mm -hmm. it looks at the value. The value is negative three. Whatever's inside there, strip off the signs. What would that one be? Order of operations. Is there a special operation here? Are there any special operations? Yeah. Absolute values are a special operation. What is the absolute value of three? Three. This stays out in front. The answer is negative three. Notice the difference between these two. They're not the same because of where the negative sign is. This one is outside. So we take the absolute value of three first. And the negatives come to it. This one, the absolute value of negative three is three. Why? Because negative three is how far from zero? One, two, three spaces. How about that? Very good. I better say, yeah, I'm going to stop you before you change your mind. <laughs> Order of operations. Absolute value. What's the absolute value of negative five? And the negatives out there? As far as you go, you're done. You cannot distribute inside the absolute value. Now, if we were going to give, this is not for your students, this is for you. If we were going to give a formula To absolute value. Whatever is inside there, whatever is inside the absolute value sign is our X. The formula we would use would be that. When you square a number, what happens to it? If a square a negative number, what happens to that number? It does what? Um, it always becomes positive. So when you, that's the reason we square it, get rid of the negative. So this one becomes a square root. I mean, the negative three squared is negative three 
times negative three is positive nine. So that, that squaring gets rid of the negative. Now, the square root of nine is three. It puts us back down where we're supposed to be. Same thing here. Square root of three squared. Three squared is nine. Square root of nine is three. So if we were going to put a formula to it, that's what we would use. Look examples. Any questions so far? So let's look at example two real quick. A, the absolute value of 20 is what? 20. The absolute value of negative five? The absolute value of zero? Yeah, because it's the distance from zero is zero. The absolute value of x is equal to three. Let's take what this means. If the absolute value, remember this is the distance. What number is three units away from zero? Right. So it would become plus or minus three. So that, that's a rule. If you have absolute value equal to some number, whatever, whatever A is, and if you drop the absolute value, you have to put a plus or minus in front of the answer. Which means X will be negative A and positive A. X plus negative five equals one. How would we go about doing this one? Remember, here's a formula for it. Is absolute value by itself? Yeah, there's nothing else outside of absolute value. So that's the first thing. You have to make sure it's by itself. If we drop the, okay, what happens inside here? You have two signs. What does that become? Now, according to my rule, I have absolute value equals some number. If I drop the absolute value sign, what happens to this number? Oops, it's one. What happens to this number? It becomes a plus or minus. So I just bring that one down. According to the rule, that's all I have to do. Now, what this means, I have two equations. I have to take one positive and one negative and solve them both separately. So to get x by itself, I have to get rid of the negative five by adding five. Five plus one is six. Same thing here. I have to add five to both sides. Five minus one is four. These are my answers. Why do you get two answers? Because on both sides of the X or zero, you have to have answers. Then always check your answer.
because check it with this one. Since we got rid of the two signs, we have absolute value of x minus 5 equals 1. Try with x being both of these. With x equals 6 and x equals 4. Six minus five equals one. What is six minus five? Absolute value of one. That's true. Now, when x equals four, four minus five equals one. What is four minus five? What is the absolute value of negative one? So both of them work. So always check your answers. Very important. Solve this one. Okay, you can't go any further. Remember, absolute values always equal what? You cannot equal negative. So this is no solution. Absolute values can never equal a negative number. Well, did we, did we go over the library of functions, the graphs, beginning of the semester? If we were to graph the absolute value of x, the graph looks like this. You know, the answer can never be negative. The answer can never be negative. It always has to be positive. And somebody can see what else, what else we had that we discussed here. Here is we discussed all this stuff already. Oh, here it is. In your sheet, the definition of addition of integers. M and N are integers. A says zero plus M equals M equals M plus zero. The commutative property. M and N are both greater than or equal to zero. What is closed under integers? What is, remember what closed meant? If M and N were integers greater than zero and we add them together, will that answer be greater than zero? Or at worst, if M and N are both equal to zero and I add them, it equals zero. If it's anything bigger, it's always going to be bigger. Um, negative M plus negative N is the same thing as... That's simply the distrib distributive property. M plus negative N 
equals negative n plus m. So again, if M and N were both negative, I could take out the negative, I have M plus N. If M plus negative N, whatever you move it, the negative has to stay with the N. Same thing here. And if I take out the negative, I got to change the signs. So look at the rest of those rules. As we've talked about them before at the beginning of the semester. Um, yeah, so all the properties of the commutative, associative, distributive, all those apply here. So look at those. And if you have any questions, we'll discuss them next time. Okie doke. Sorry, too long again. I should make them shorter. <laughs>